We are very thankful to the GIZ for funding this project, and uh, we have been doing this study since 2010. In 2010, we started with the uh, development of the conceptual framework, and then we got additional funding for doing the implementation of the conceptual framework that we developed. Now, this is the first place we are doing a presentation about the final results that we are getting from this uh, sort of a four-year project, and uh, where else than GIZ, I mean, from ZEF, where we have been collaborating very closely on uh, doing this study. And uh, we, we have, pro pro this project is coming to an end, toward the end of this year, and uh, our biggest plan is to publish a book. We are already signing a contract with the Springer, in which we'll uh, uh, report all the results and uh, we are actually going to the head the the, the, chap, the the book will be called the economics of land degradation and improvement there is an i which we have added for a very strong reasons because the results we are seeing it is not all about land degradation there is also improvement and an aspect which is very very important uh, there are people who are calling this economics of sustainable land management which they are on the positive side. They are leaving out the land degradation. Now, for us, historically, we have been talking about ELD. We have added an I because, as you will see, there is a lot of uh, improvement that is, is happening. Uh, now, today, what we are doing, we are going to re be reporting the, the, econo the, the land degradation. The land degradation aspect, which is very important, how we are computing it is something which is very simple, but at the same time is very complicated. And it is giving us an insight of land degradation that we have not seen before. It has not been reported in literature. And we are going to share today what we, we got. And uh, I just expect to, you to give me one gift. Criticize very much what we are doing so that we can improve it. We are also making a video we showed it at the, uh, the Global Soil Week. We had that video, we are gonna have it, and there's even more things that uh, we are currently doing. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of new things. The first thing was actually to use and to improve the NDVI. The NDVI is a measure of greenness that uh, the FAO and uh, other uh, bodies that are doing the uh, uh, land degradation have been using we have corrected for that because uh, there is carbon fertilization and the issues related to rainfall variability that also affects NDVI. We have corrected for, for that and we are about to publish a, a, a discussion paper very soon. And this one was led by Bao. Bao was a student of ZEF. So this is ZEF product. And uh, we, it is really going very strong. And we are doing, we are using the total economic value of land to assess how it has changed over time. The Millennium Ecosystem Services uh, report in 2005 defines uh, land degradation as loss of ecosystem services over long term. And there's a very big, huge change and very big difference between the, 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 the traditional assessment of eco uh, economics of, uh, of, of land degradation if you are not looking at all the value of ecosystems that are lost or they are, they, they, they are gained. And the results, as you see, and you have, you have seen in, the, in the, the short brief, they are astoundingly different uh, from what we have been using before. Uh, to assess the land degradation, we are looking at the change of land use. The land use change can lead to improvement of ecosystem services or it can lead to degradation or loss of ecosystem services, depending on what is changed, replacing what. If a forest is cut and crops are planted, there is a loss of ecosystem services because the value of the forest is very much higher than the value of the other, of the, the, the crops. Uh, so that, that's just like an example. Thank you. Uh, in addition, uh, we, we are going to look at land that did not change. There was no land use change. The same cropland was in 2000, and the same land is today used as cropland. So 
there is still land degradation there. As you see, the land degradation is happening a lot in agricultural land, and majority of the studies in the past have actually focused very much on the cropland and dark stock, and uh, they are not looking very much into the, the cropland, I mean, the, the land use change, and that's something that uh, we are looking today. In addition to that, we're also doing focus group discussion uh, because the MODIS data is uh, based on the satellites and all that, but the satellites cannot see what's happening on the ground. They can only tell us that a, a forest changed to cropland, but what are the farmers feeling or how are the communities feeling? That one is something that uh, we have to go speak with the local people for us to know what is actually done, what, what, is, what is actually happening. We are very fortunate. We have interns who are working with us. Uh, they are funded again with GIZ, which is very good news because interns always work harder than everybody else. And we have them, they are going to these several countries, and they are within this uh, 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 audience right now as we speak. Um, now, because I have a lot of things to do, uh, to show you, I may confuse you on the way. So I want to get started with conclusions, so if you get confused over the way, you must have got the message that we want to pass. So based only on land use change and land cover change, the total cost of land degradation is about 2.2 trillion US dollars. This is about 4% of the global GDP of about 57 trillion. This is a very big loss. And Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for the largest loss in the world. Europe, where I'm actually standing on right now, has the minimum loss of ecosystem services. So congratulations to Europe you are doing better than the rest of the world. And one other thing which is interesting is that the hotspots of loss of the cost of land degradation, they are both in developed countries and in developing countries. It's not only the story that, oh, it's in Africa where the land degradation is happening. No, no, no. We are going to see hotspots in developed countries. Um, now, this is the big difference, that we are seeing that 62% of the loss of ecosystem services is actually incurred by the global community or the national level community. The people who are, are taking care of the land, the, the ones that are get, getting direct cost of land degradation, that direct cost of land degradation to farmers, to land users, is only 38%. So, it's the world that is actually bearing the, the brunt of land degradation. And the people, the local people, they are just bearing about 38% of that land degradation. So this land degradation is a global problem. It is not a local problem. And I'm going to show you and uh, justify all that. Now, let's now get started. You can fall asleep because you have got the main message and the conclusions of the study itself. This is not the first study that has done the cost of land degradation. There was one which was done by FAO about 2007. They estimated the total cost is only 40 billion US dollars per year. Look at what we are saying, 2.2 trillion. There's a very huge, big difference. And another one which was done last year, UNCCD, they report about 490 billion US dollars. Again, look at what we are seeing. What's the difference? Why are our numbers so big and so dramatically different from the rest? It's because we are using the total economic value that is according to the definition of land degradation used by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. That's the biggest reason that we can explain uh, that big difference. Um, what approach are we using? It's a very simple approach. It's the total economic value approach. And uh, in this one, we use uh, what we call in economics the value transfer approach, that you do case studies in selected areas, and then, but you have to select those case study areas in a way which is going to allow you to in, uh, extrapolate the results to areas which are relevant. And the TIB, we are very lucky with Mark Shower is in here, he was uh, one of either the secretary of TIP. They did a lot of studies all around the world. In total, there were the 300 case studies around the world to do the total economic value. And we use those values to be able to transfer the value to the other areas where the, that, that such study was not done. 
And this has allowed us to attach values to all the biomes that we are using in this case to be able to know the value of land degradation or, um, or improvement in, a, in every area, depending on the case studies that were done and uh, where we applied those values that we got from the TIB uh, website that has very good data, which uh, we use a lot. Um, now, as we say that land use change can be a land degradation or it can be an improvement depending on what is replacing what. But at the same time, we do have other forms of land degradation which uh, the land, there was no land use change, but there was land degrading management practices used and those ones can also lead to land degradation. For those ones, we are using a global level simulation, crop simulation and also livestock simulation models. Uh, Evelyn is here, is a, uh, one of these, the other student who is with us. She's doing the livestock model or uh, global model to be able to determine the, the land degradation that uh, comes from uh, de de degrading grazing lands. And then we are, I'm going to receive the results today about the global level simulation analysis showing the land degraded areas and the, the yield over time, how, how it's changed for, so that we can be able to get the value of the cost of land degradation in areas that have been looking at uh, using land degrading management practices. So the way it, it works is that uh, we, I'm sorry, this is, I'm trying to do, oh no, I'm not gonna trust it anyway. But anyway, what we are doing, the cost of land degradation, CLD, <coughs> is given by the change of land use. And the change of land use, you can, like you are changing from forest to crops. Maybe forest is the TV one, total economic value one, minus the value that you gain because you have planted crops. If you plant crops, so you are replacing the value that you were getting from the forest by a smaller value. So that difference is where there is a change, the, the, value, the, the change in value of the ecosystem services. So there is a big value that you are taking away and you replace it with a smaller value, which is the TV2, the cropland value that you get from that. And that difference is what we see as the cost of land degradation. If it is negative, it means that there was an improvement. But if it is positive, it means, that, it means that there was land degradation. So that simple formula is what we used. And then for the non-land use, we are using the, the, the simulation models. And this one, uh, over time, you see if there was declining of, of yield, uh, land productivity, then you just multiply by the total economic value that you have. Uh, the data that we, we have, we are using for uh, the land use change uh, degradation, uh, we are using the MODIS data, which is the mod moderate zero resolution imaging, imaging spectral radiometer. Uh, this data is from 2001 to 2010. This data is very good, much better than the NDVI because it's ground truth. They have been ground truth and the resolution is very good, one kilometer, which is much better than the NDVI, which is about eight kilometers. And the, the biggest thing is that it is ground truth. So it's a forest, it's a forest. It's not something else. And that, that thing gives us a very good confidence to see the, the dynamics of land use change over time in the, in the area that we are looking at, that we are sure of what we are seeing. And that's something which helps us very much to be able to, to, to determine the TV. And then the prices of crops, we use the, the provisioning services. Uh, this was from F, FAO. And then the, 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 the TIB uh, data set that we had as I said, there were about 300 uh, case studies. And then the, for the, the land degradation of land that did not experience land use change, we are doing the, the crop simulation and also the trade-off analysis uh, that uh, Evelyn is uh, doing with uh, the colleagues. And then the forest and woodlands, we did not have data and uh, we are just making an assumption that if Modis is telling us there was a forest in 2001 and a forest in 2010, we assume that it did not degrade itself. It remains with its uh, value as it was in the past. So we are making just that assumption and the economists are very famous uh, in making a lot of assumptions. And they have two hands all the time. And why Modis, I have explained that. And then, uh, now th these are the results that we get from the TIB uh, study. Forest is the most, the, the, it has the highest value of all the biomes that we have on land. 
uh, it, its value is the largest, but if you look at the, the oceans, uh, then the oceans, they have much larger value, but we are dealing with land, we are not long looking at the ocean. Uh, so it has the largest value, it's about 5,000 US dollars per year per hectare. That's a very big, large value. Uh, but the tropical forests actually are more valuable than the biomes in the, the temperature countries and the grassland is followed and then the woodlands. I'm, I did not put the crops because they vary very, very, very widely. Just imagine you have one hectare in northern Tanzania and that same hectare in Kansas where I did my degree. The difference between those two are too big. I didn't want to give you a confusing number here. So they are very big. Manage ecosystem services, they vary a lot. And I'm not putting them here, but we have them in our analysis. So what's the per capita GDP? We know this story. We know which are countries are rich and which are poor. But the story changes when you look at the total economic value of the biome that you're looking at, which is forest, uh, grassland, uh, woodlands, and all that. And this is the story that, well, we see that Northern America still has, is very rich, but Brazil is also very rich, and uh, we can see DRC Congo in Africa is a middle-income country. But when you look at the GDP, uh, DRC is the second or the fourth poorest country in the world. Now, this study, it tells us a wrong story. Why? Even though Congo has, is endowed with very rich ecosystem services, but the benefits that are accruing from the forest in Congo, they are not internalized in the country only. About 60% of that is because of the carbon sequestration, which Congo, yes, there is carbon sequestration happening, but that's the benefit of the world and is not Congo. So even though this one tells us the, 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 local, the, the local location of those benefits, but those benefits are accrued and the benefits are drawn by the world and not where the forest is. So it is a map which is showing the location of the value, but the people who are benefiting from that value are not located in the area where that value is. And that's where my conclusion was saying that, well, land degradation is 60% of the value is lost by the world and not the local people who, where that, uh, those biomes are, are located. And so this map, I'm just showing it, but it's a very wrong map. It, it should not tell you that uh, DRC Congo is very rich. We know it's poor because they cannot internalize the benefits of the, the biomes that they have locally. Now, this is the costs of land degradation. And uh, we are looking at that with, we are comparing with the GDP, the, the traditional uh, method methods that we use. And then what I want to draw your attention are some aspects. Look at you as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The cost of land degradation is about 526 billion US dollars. As percent of the total loss the, of uh, ecosystem services, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for about 17% of that. But if you look at that loss, again, in a very myopic way, you are assuming that the benefits, the total economic value of the biomes in Africa are internalized within the region, then we can say that the cost of land degradation as percent of, of uh, the GDP is about 60%. The, uh, again, you can see one thing which is very clear in this case, that because the region of Africa is very much dependent on natural resources, its value, its economic value, is very much determined by the natural resources, and as such, we see that as percent of the GDP, it, it accounts for about 60%. But again, I keep repeating the same thing, that we are not internalizing the benefits, and we are also not internalizing the cost of land degradation within Africa. So I'm giving you this just to tell you the, the, the importance of looking at the global level when we are doing the, 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 the land degradation aspects, given that the benefits of, of uh, improvement 
are not internalized in an area where we are just part of it is internalized and the other part is not, and also that the cost of land degradation, they are not only located in an area where the, the, the land degradation is happening. And we are seeing Europe here, it has the lowest value, only 0 0.4, and that's something which is telling you that where this area, the, the, there is a, quite an improvement. Um, now this is the map. Where is this, uh, the severity of land degradation located? Now look at the hotspots, look at the darkest uh, areas, the northern uh, uh, Russia, uh, and then Alaska, and the northern, very northern uh, Canada, and of course we have seen the, the Amazon, uh, the de de degradation, degradation that's happening. So all what we are saying is that the cost of land degradation is allocated both in high-income countries and in low-income countries. Um, now, let's compare this with uh, the, what Bauer has done in this study that we are talking about, which corrects for carbon fertilization and also for the, the rain for variability. We see more or less the same pattern. We are seeing that there is the same severe uh, uh, loss of NDVI in northern Canada and then in Alaska and then in this area. And we are also seeing the same thing here and this area. Again, I can just uh, bring back so you can uh, follow what is going on. And this one here. Uh, so who bears the heaviest burden of the cost of land degradation? The answer is obvious, the world. 62% of the cost of land degradation either it goes to the world or off-site, off the farm, where that kind of land degradation is happening. Uh, now, that was the global look. We picked uh, a few countries to look at the case studies and uh, just uh, put into perspective uh, the aspects. And I'm going to talk about Bhutan. I saw a name which uh, sounded like Bhutanese. Is there a Bhutanese in this country? Because I want him or her to be very proud. He didn't come. But anyway, so we talk good things about Bhutan and the, there's no Bhutanese. Uh, we, now, we are, um, we are taking Bhutan because it's one of the case study countries. And they have very interesting thing that can put into context the thing that we are looking at the global level. So we did this study and uh, we, we looked at the, the opportunities in, uh, in Bhutan that First of all, the, the first thing that one would know is that uh, the, 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 the mountains and those very steep slopes, those are actually opportunities for generation of hydroelectric power. 22% of the GDP of the country is accounted for by hydroelectric power, but there is a lot of soil erosion which uh, puts a lot of sediment loading into those hydroelectric power plants in such a way that uh, the country spends about uh, uh, about two, two, two point, I mean, uh, quite a big uh, percentage of its uh, GDP uh, to take care of that, that problem. Now, the good thing about uh, Bhutan is that they have very strong cultural values related to, to, to the environment. Uh, and, that, and I think you, you know that the Mahayan Buddhism, uh, this one is uh, coexistent with nature, is very eco-friendly. And 25% uh, of the population lives in protected areas. And that tells you that if they are living in protected areas, they are very eco-friendly. Otherwise, they would have cleared the whole forest, but they have not. And uh, that tells you that they, they, those cultural values, they are actually very good, and they, they should be uh, exploited. One thing which was very shocking is that there was a lot of land which has been abandoned by the people, and the reason behind that abandonment, 34% of them were saying that because of wildlife. In my country, in other countries, the wildlife will be killed. Humans will not run away from wildlife. It happens in Bhutan, telling you that those eco-friendly uh, eco uh, cultural values are very important for uh, achieving the sustainable land management. Uh, now, because uh, Alicia is already waging some time, uh, I would like to go straight to the problem uh, that the country is facing. Uh, the first thing is that there was a policy in 1961 to 1980 for harvesting the Himalayas, just the same thing that we see in the Amazon. They wanted to conquer the Amazon, which was a jungle. In Bhutan, they also wanted to have this, more or less the same policy. 
of harvesting uh, the, 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 the forest. It happened, but it killed the local values uh, that uh, was uh, very much uh, preserving the, the, the environment. And there was a lot of land degradation, uh, forest de degradation. As such, the, the country is currently using about 16 million US dollars to just take into account the sediment loading that is, it increased significantly during those times. And also there's a lot of construction and that construction, road construction is leading to a lot, a very severe land degradation. Like look, look at this river. It's well loaded with a, a lot of sediment because of the construction that's happening as you can see here. Uh, this is leading to the, the type of land degradation that we see. Now, if you look at the also low productivity, the, there is low adoption rate uh, and low productivity of those uh, uh, management practices and the low adoption rate of manure, inorganic fertilizer, improved seed and private forest. Now, this is something which is very interesting. We are seeing what uh, we are calling unholy cross. Unholy cross is the situation where we are looking at the returns of profitability of different land management practices. One would expect as an economist that, well, the more profitable land management is, the higher the adoption rate. But we are seeing the opposite, and that's why the trend lines showing the profitability of land management and its adoption rate, they are going in the more opposite direction, forming what we are calling the unholy cross. This was the case in Bhutan, and I'm going to also show you another case in several countries in Africa, the same exact thing. The, the, the message is, the most profitable land management practices are the ones which are more sustainable, but the adoption rate is low. Why? And uh, that, those kind of things. For Bhutan, we saw that tenure security was very important uh, for them to adopt manure, urea, and all that. And also owning livestock was very important. Access to roads and also extension services were all very important aspects that we actually, because of the lower uh, access to roads and also extension agents, those we are leading to, uh, to low adoption even when such management practices are most profitable and also very sustainable. Uh, this is showing the access to extension services and also roads. As you can see, about 30% of the population is living away more than, more than three hours away from the road. And that's something which is very serious. So we did a, a SWAT model uh, to look at the sediment loading with a sustainable land management and without, and we saw that it can be reduced by about 50% if there is sustainable forest management and also for agriculture it reduced by 23%. And these are the sediment loading with and without SLM in Bhutan. Now the message that we wanted to say that if farmers upstream are managing sustainably their forest, they get only, uh, uh, it's about only 40% of the benefit accrues to them. The other 60% accrues downstream in the hydroelectric power generation plants. So there should be some methods of compensating the people upstream so that they can do this sustainable land management because they cannot internalize the benefits of managing forest sustainably so that they can reduce the sediment loading that we are seeing. And uh, what can be done? The country is already doing this uh, payment for ecosystem services, but it's doing it in the wrong way. The piece, the, the, uh, the hydroelectric power generation, they are giving that money to the government, and the government provide accession services to the people to tell them, oh, plant trees. They have no connection between the, 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 the hydroelectric power plants and the farmers who are implementing that. And our recommendation was that they should be giving that money direct to the farmers instead of passing it through the government. Now, let me go to Sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, just a reminder that uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is accounting for about 17% uh, of the cost of land degradation that we have seen, but it accounts for about 20% uh, 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 24, 24 of the, the total economic value. We asked the farmers in Nigeria a simple question. Are you aware of provisioning services in your area? They know it very well, about 100% of them. Regulating services, including the climate regulation, only 8% of the communities we interviewed, they had an idea that there was a benefit of their forest doing carbon, carbon sequestration, but 
92% of the communities had no idea about carbon sequestration. So if you are investing and you are giving, prodding the farmers to, okay, keep your forest because it is doing carbon regulation, you are just not talking the language that anybody can understand. Meaning that if people don't know, they are not going to invest uh, to, to, include, uh, to increase the benefit uh, that uh, we, the world is looking at. But now if you look at the climate mitigation and all that, they are talking of mitigation, a language which the farmers are not understanding, and that's why we do not see much uh, response to such uh, the, carbon, the climate change uh, issues uh, that we talk about. And the cultural services, this one is uh, quite interesting, that the spiritual values, 59% of the people know about the spiritual values of the forest and other ecosystem services that are, are happening in the area. So they are very much aware of this. That's uh, good news to us, and we have to take, uh, to, to take that into account. I would have given you a, a story in, in Uganda where the government sold a, a forest uh, called Mabira Forest, and the communities around that forest said, oh, no, no, don't cut that forest to plant uh, biofuel uh, sugarcane because our spirits live in that forest. If you cut it, they are going to be angry, will not have rainfall, and that's not a good news. Now, the scientists would tell you the same exact story that the farmers were saying, but the languages that the scientists are using and the farmers are using is different. They are talking of spirits, but you are talking about the ecosystem services that we derive from the forest that it is. It catches rainfall and all those things. Now, there are language of the people, spirits, language of the scientists, ecosystem services. We are talking about the same thing. One is calling it a big spoon, another one is calling it a spade. But same exact thing. The government didn't know. They thought, oh, we are creating jobs, we have to cut the forest and plant sugarcane. They didn't have no idea about the ecosystem services, the spirit, the, the cultural values that the people we are, we are obtaining. Now, we did a, a comparison of the value that a, for, a, a farmer who is uh, by the forest, they are trying to debate on whether to cut the forest and plant maize or to keep the forest. And we just took the value, the provisioning values that the farmers obtained from that forest, and the decision was that the forest should be cut to plant maize because these are the tangible benefits that uh, the people get from the timber, uh, from the forest, and this is the maize. So the maize value, is they, they obtain about, five, about 600 US dollars per hectare, but if they just take the forest itself without the timber, uh, you, uh, you get only 90. So the solution is cut the forest and plant maize. Now, these are the results I'm showing what has been changing in Africa, which has been oh, um, accounting for 23% of the, the, the loss. There has been a lot of forest loss because they are planting the crops that we have seen here. The solution of this guy, cut the trees and plant maize. And this is what we are seeing. Those are the countries that have changed their land use type for a long time. So I have run out of my time, but the only thing which I wanted to show the unholy cross again in Africa it is the, uh, obtained from Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Tanzania, those countries. The same thing that we saw in, uh, in Bhutan. And uh, one of the reasons is that we asked the extension agents in Nigeria, what messages do you give to, to your farmers? Improved seeds, 60% of them. Inorganic fertilizer, 18% of them. Agrochemicals, 10% of them. Planting spacing, 10% of them. Organic Fertilizer, only 1% are telling people about organic inputs as the important thing. There's nothing about climate change. There's nothing about other things that are very important, ecosystem services, meaning that the farmers are not educated about some of the important aspects that we want them to, to know. Now, I think I should end up here because the, the conclusion I gave them in the beginning. So, Alicia, I'm going to shut up and listen to the people. Thank you very much.